Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puka and welcome to my symposium. I'm a PhD and a university lecturer and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, hysteticism, paganism, shamanism, satanism and all things occult. I'm now at the University College Cork for the conference of the European Society for the Study of Western Hystericism, which we normally abbreviate as SWE conference, that's how we say it among us academics. I am going to deliver a paper on the devil and um, reinterpretations of the devil and relation with pop culture. I filmed the video so that you can see it and tell me what you think about it. So now I, won't, I, I will leave you to it. And um, please, as always, consider supporting my work with a one-off people donation by joining memberships or my inner symposium on Patreon. That is, if you want me to keep the, this project going and the academic fund going, I really appreciate any kind of help if you have the means at all. And otherwise, liking, commenting, subscribing and sharing the videos with your friends is also um, a great way to help my project and allow me to keep doing this academic content on all things esoteric. Now I'm gonna leave you to my paper and I hope you enjoy it. And I hope I wasn't too bad at delivering it. We will see. Future Angela <laughs> will, <laughs> will tell us. <laughs> this is past Angela prior to the paper, by the way. So I'm still nervous. As you can tell. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Angela Puka and today I will be talking about the devil impact of pop culture in reshaping the archetypal adversary um, for contemporary magic practitioners. So, first of all, uh, I want to set the tone for the paper with a couple of quotes. <laughs> Awake, arise, or be forever fallen, from Paradise Lost by John Newton, and whitest and fairest from the angels sprung, God whom fate betrayed and left unsung. I thought that these two quotations kind of set the tone for uh, what we are talking about, which is not as much as a hero, or what became to be seen as a hero, but more like a heroic figure with uh, some heroic tones. First of all, let's talk about terminology. And I want to thanks um, to I want to give thanks to Per Patnet because we went to Dublin together and we had very long conversations. He's kind of the expert on Satanism and also uh, historic Satanism. We had long conversations so I just want to acknowledge his help in getting a better understanding of, of the matter. So here in this paper, I will be using the devil uh, synonymously for Satan and Lucifer. And also, I'm not going to touch on theological themes in Christianity, but uh, more in depictions in, in pop culture and how that influenced esoteric Satanism and contemporary magic practitioners. Also, the, the rationale, of course, for collating these figures is that in popular culture and literature, these figures are used as synonymous. Whereas, but I am at the same time aware that uh, contemporary practitioners now have established a distinction between Lucifer, Satan, and the devil. More specifically, Lucifer, for, for instance, in Lucifer and witchcraft, it is seen as quite different from the devil and from Satan. So I acknowledge the difference, but it's not what I'm talking about, because I'm talking about the figure of the devil, and uh, which includes Satan and Lucifer. And this happens to be, it happens to be the case that these are collated when it comes to pop culture and uh, also in, in the scholarship, in the academic scholarship that I worked with. So uh, first let's talk about the romanticizing of Satan. So um, Satan became romanticized as a figure as Van uh, Van Luc, if I'm pronouncing it right, explains in Children of Lucifer. Uh, there have been two cultural changes that fostered a reshaped idea of Satan, or indeed the devil, uh, during the Romanticism, and that happened after the Enlightenment, with some uh, also key changes that occurred in the Enlightenment, more specifically the secularization 
And during Romanticism, the process of secularization that occurred during the Enlightenment allowed for people to not see the devil or Satan as, um, as evil in and of itself. So the ontological weight of this figure was lessened. And that allowed for, that left enough space for people not to feel as um, fearful about this figure. Because if you have uh, that a specific figure is associated with evil incarnate, and you have a process of secularization that allows you not to see that as the actual evil incarnate, but more as a symbol of uh, evil, that allows you to challenge that kind of symbolism because it doesn't feel as threatening any longer. And also during the Romanticism, you have the uh, famous political revolutions. And so the combination of the process of secularization that allowed for the devil to not feel as real and as scary, along with the, the revolutions and the association of the devil with you know, the, this person that has um, the arch, well, not, it moves from being the arch enemy of God to the person that was heroic enough to rebel against the most powerful creature on the earth. And uh, that sort of mirrors what happened with revolutions because monarch could be seen, could have been seen as sort of God and the people rebelling against the monarch would be um, sort of, could, could feel a sympathy for the devil in that sense because they would be rebelling against the, the, the main power, dominant power. Now, uh, from the 19th century onwards, so we have this shift during the Romanticism and thanks to the process of secularization during the Enlightenment. From the 19th century onwards, the Romanticized Satan has been linked to um, a few different traits. So, a sex and sexual liberation, which comes from the idea, from the concept of uh, Satan being a fallen angel, which is in, um, you know, you have the base of that in Genesis 6 and then it is expanded more in uh, First Enoch. Science and reason. Science and reason also becomes associated with, um, with the figure of Satan and with Lucifer as the bringer of light and because it, it is associated with um, you know, uh, the re rebellion not only against monarchy in, political, in the political sense, but also the rebellion against the um, uh, hegemonic Christianity. And also individual freedom and age. Right. <laughs> and also individual in, in freedom and agency. So then, um, when it comes to esoteric, the esoteric <coughs> interpretations of uh, Satan and the devil, we see that there has been um, a very interesting influence that Satanism has played on the left-hand path, on left-hand path traditions that are still uh, in the contemporary esoteric milieu. And uh, Granova and Peterson highlight the main traits of the left-hand path traditions, which are an ideology of individualism, the goal of self-dedication, the appraisal of life in the here and now, and antinomianism, which is the rejection of social and cultural norms. Now, um, this reimagined Satan as this rebellious figure, as um, someone who is, uh, is able to rebel against God and at the same time is uh, linked to sexual liberation and to revolution and to science and reason. These are all elements that have fostered, and we'll see that with, um, uh, with Kenneth Grant, uh, with um, Kenneth Grant, for instance, uh, and in, in Satanism, that these have fostered the left-hand path, uh, and that's why in the left-hand path tradition, among other things, you also see uh, esoteric Satanism. And these are also elements that you find in esoteric Satanism as well, because these are uh, elements that are associated now with, uh, with this reimagined uh, perception of the devil. Now, um, when it comes to art and pop culture, the first occurrences that we see, where we see a reimagined um, figure of the devil, where the devil presents the kind of traits that I talked about, where first of all, Paradise Lost by Newton, there was 
definitely a, a pivotal moment in literature where we see a reimagination of the devil, not as much as a hero, but more as a heroic figure. And it also inspired a lot of art. So if we see uh, art and pop culture on a timeline, we can see that literature comes first in terms of uh, depictions and reimaginations of the devil as this heroic figure that rebel that is able to rebel against the highest power and um, go towards uh, a process of self deification or self realization in his own terms. Then we have we have uh, depictions in art, which I'm not uh, really touching on. Then we have um, music, and then it really it, it arrives at um Western Stoicism, and uh, how these depictions have been incorporated in Stoic Satanism in the left hand path. And as we will see, they are also influencing or are useful to better understand contemporary magic practices. Then we have, uh, of course, there are many, many literary uh, pieces that have this kind of perception of Satan, um, you know, that present the traits that I just showed, but I just selected three <laughs> representative ones. So we have Brother's Lost, which was a pivotal moment, and it really affected the, the, the perception of Satan and the devil from that moment onwards. Then we have the Italian poem, Inno Satana, by Josue Carducci. And uh, here, uh, Satan is depicted as Satan, reason and meaning, matter and spirit. Um, and it, you can see how this links very well with the first positive depiction of Lucifer in Stoicism, which is by Theosophy. And uh, we see that first positive depiction in the, um, uh, Helena Petrovna Blavatsky um, book where she defines Lucifer as the, as the source of light and as a source of knowledge and linked to uh, the achievement of Gnosis. Then we have The Hour of the Devil by Fernando de Soa, the Portuguese uh, poet uh, and my favorite poet. And in The Hour of the Devil, um, the devil and Mary are going to a masquerade and the devil describes himself as the, the king of the interstices and uh, of poets and uh, of everything that is creative and uh, is able to um, sort of channel a creative force that goes beyond what is um, bounded by, by limits. So it, is a, it gives a sense of a boundless creativity and um, of a, also of a boundless sense of self-creation. Uh, so I think that, that it is a, a short story, The Hour of the Devil, and, or The Devil's Hour, uh, depending on how it's translated in English. But uh, it's really um, representative, I think, of uh, a, a certain perception that we have in literature of the devil, a certain reimagination. Then we have, of course, the rock and metal scene, which was expanded more uh, here, and especially the black metal scene in Northern Europe was extremely important in setting the scene for the devil and Satan as this um, um, figure that presents the traits that I, that I showed earlier, so uh, sort of creative figure that rebels against the, the most powerful creature and uh, creates his own self um, in, in his own or uh, her own terms. So some examples are that present the, um, the elements that I showed earlier, where you know that is associated with rebellion, sexual freedom. Uh, knowing your dark side and uh, even humanism. You have Sympathy for the Devil of the Rolling Stones, um, where, uh, where the devil is depicted as a man of wealth and taste. Uh, Near I Be by Black Sabbath, where Lucifer is in love with humanity and this links well with certain uh, forms of Satanism, like the Lavean Satanism. And then Lucifer Rising by Rob Zombie, where there is the sexual love alert that. Um, you, you find a link to the figure of the devil. And then of course we have Marilyn Manson, you know, the whole <laughs> Marilyn Manson of just one song, uh, where uh, that is connected to Ladeian uh, themes of the devil. So you have the rebellion against the capitalist society, um, the uh, hegemonic, the Christian hegemonic morality, and the centralized state power. So you have, um, Lavian Satanism is often described as a as an atheistic form of Satanism, even though in the works by Lavey you can see that there are you know also elements 
that could be seen as theistic, and there is, of course, uh, historicism as well, part of historical practices. Then let's um, move on to TV shows. <laughs> so um, the this is the image that I use for my slides, and it comes from Lucifer, the TV show Lucifer. And it is based on the DC Comics character in the Sandman series. Lucifer, in, in this TV show, is tired of being the Lord of Hell, and uh, he's tired of punishing people. So since he is bored and unhappy with his life in Hell, he abdicates uh, his throne in defiance with his father, and moves to LA, <laughs> where he runs his own nightclub called Lux, which means light in, um, in Latin, and collaborates with the police department. And it's interesting how he's depicted because basically one of the reasons why he's able to help the police department is because he uh, is able to see the deepest desire of every person. And once you know somebody's deepest desire, then you have a leverage on how to influence them. So here we have a depiction of Lucifer that in a way incarnates all the elements that I said earlier. So he's very uh, charming and sexual, he's able to um, influence people, you know the darkest desires, at the same time he's independent um, and he helps people. So there is also this theme of uh, Lucifer wanting to help humanity, which is also another element you could find in this reimagination of the devil and of Satan. Now, uh, I would say that this reimagination of the devil is an indicator of a general reassessment of ethics uh, in, in our society, in a society that was um, prior perhaps to the Enlightenment and Romanticism, was more influenced by Christian dichotomous morality of good and evil. Uh, but uh, you don't just see that with the figure of the devil and Satan, but even with other so-called evil figures that in recent years, in recent decades, have become more nuanced. So for instance, you have the good place, this is the good place, this is good omens, and here, in both cases, uh, the good place is meant to represent sort of heaven and hell, but they don't use Christian terminology, and so they call it the good place and the bad place. But then, as you move forward, there's also one of the protagonists who's a, a moral philosopher, a professor. <laughs> so there are interesting ethical discussions. And um, you have this very nuanced perception of the good place and the bad place. So you can see how um, it is not, uh, you know, you, you don't have a perception of good and evil in such strict terms, not even of the so called heaven, the good place or the bad place. In good moments, you have a, 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 a a demon and an angel. The demon is called Crowley. <laughs> and uh, even in this case, at, at first it seems like one is evil and one is good, but then the more they progress, the more inevitably you realize that actually the two are interspersed and intermingled and it's impossible to, dis to disentangle the two. And in Vampire Diaries and in Buffy you have the demonic figures such as vampires but in, in both cases, you see that they actually have or develop a soul. So I think that this reimagination of the devil, who used to be seen as the as evil incarnate, and now in pop culture is depicted more as sort of the, the cool guy that allows you to be free and to uh, explore, you know, your sexuality or explore your individuality beyond the, the, the binds and the limits created by society or by a certain uh, dichotomous morality. You see that also across the board, not just with the devil. That's why perhaps um, analyzing how the, the devil, who has been considered in, in the Christian dominant ethics in Western countries, certainly in Italy, certainly in Italy, uh, where is the, and that's where I do most of my field work, even though this is not based primarily on hospitality. But um, you can see how that um, Christian dichotomous morality is loosening up over time. So you, it's not, um, you don't have that very demarcated and stark sense of good and evil anymore. And that, and, you know, that reimagination of the devil perhaps helps us understand this change better. Now, let's see why does uh, pop culture matter. So pop culture matters uh, for us scholars because it is a new ongoing myth-making. 
we, we see that even with new religious movement, how important it is, how of culture it is when it comes to TV shows and uh, even comics, even video games, everything plays a massive role in how practitioners, contemporary practitioners, create, make meaning of their practice. Because I would say that religion and religious practices are ultimately about belief making and myth making and meaning making. And all these things, you know, stories are important for human beings. Stories give, have value for human beings. And if you see a story that is gripping, that you resonate with, that will become part of the meaning making process and the belief making process that will inform your religious beliefs and your religious worldview as well. Also, uh, TV shows and generally pop culture, uh, even video games and um, uh, yeah, literature, uh, can be gateways to religious practices and beliefs. So there are many, um, for instance, many pagans that got interested in uh, heathenry or northern paganism thanks to Viking, the TV show, because they, they felt it resonated with them and they uh, got interested in northern paganism. So it can be, in a lot of cases, a gateway to religious practices and beliefs. And so it's important for scholars to acknowledge that so that we can better understand how these new religious movements de develop and how, and, um, how they develop and their uh, inception. Also, it has a bi-directional resonance because um, pop culture influences viewers or consumers of the pop culture, but at the same time, um, a show or a specific pop culture output uh, becomes popular only insofar as it resonates with the viewers. So it needs to respond enough to the zeitgeist of the time to become popular. And at the same time, by becoming popular, it influences people and their beliefs and how they make meaning of the world. Now, why did his, uh, this reimagined devil useful and to whom? To whom? To scholars in this case? So, um, this reimagined devil allows scholars to better understand a few things. So the inclusion of Lucifer, oh, um, the inclusion of Lucifer by pagan and magic practitioners. So as I mentioned in my paper for the EASR on Hecatin, there are many magic practitioners that uh, are currently uh, employed, working with Lucifer alongside either Hecate or Lilith, and they employ Lucifer as, not employ, they work with Lucifer in a duodistic scheme that is uh, influenced by Wicca, so the, the idea of the goddess and the god, they work with the goddess and the god, but in this case it's uh, Lucifer and uh, Hecate or Lilith, those are the most popular combinations. So if this reimagined that allows pagan study scholars and Israeli study scholars to better understand how come contemporary practitioners, even those that are not Satan, Satanists, they do not define themselves as Satanists, how come they are employing uh, Lucifer and Hecate, for instance, uh, in, their, in their practice? And that is because Lucifer is now associated, just as Hecate is, to a darkness that allows to shed a light, so to an enlightening darkness, if that makes sense. And also, uh, he, he still retains that perception of freeing you from, from certain boundaries. So for some people, it is useful to, some pagans, it is useful to work with Lucifer because it allows to detach yourself from a certain Christian background that you may have uh, been raised into. Um, and also, as I said, my paper on Hecate, um, you know, Hecate is associated with shadow work, which is connected to Jungian uh, interpretation, Jungian psychological interpretations. Also, it allows us to better understand the endorsement of a nuanced ethics, in this case by practitioners, because I'm talking about how it can be useful for scholars, but as I said, I think this is a trend that you see in the wider culture, the wider culture, but especially within magic practitioners, I would argue. And also the emergence of hex positivity, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this term, but uh, hex positivity is a thing and it's going on among the community of magic practitioners, uh, even um, Thelemites. And uh, hex positivity is kind of a response to the Wiccan ethics when it comes to magic, where uh, you know the, the Wiccan ethics say that everything that you do will come back threefold. And so some practitioners feel that Wicca is to you know light and love, and uh, that nobody talks 
about the darker aspects of magic. And so some practitioners have coined the term magic positivity and they talk about it on podcasts, blogs and uh, their social media to mean that uh, it is important to acknowledge the dark side of, um, of yourself as a magic practitioner but also of your magic practice. And also the wider cultural change in society that inevitably affects esoteric practices. Uh, so I think that this is also important to acknowledge for, for us scholars because it allows us to better understand the, how uh, esoteric practitioners make meaning of, of their world and how they interpret their ethics. And uh, I think that this reimagined perception of the devil actually really helps and has been quite influential for uh, magic practitioners across the board. So thank you very much for your attention and I was on social media. <laughs> I'm on TikTok and um, on YouTube so in case you want to check out my, my work uh, which is not just about <laughs> the devil but uh, I'm mostly a pagan studies scholar. But I, I generally study magic uh, in religious practices. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.